Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. We thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. We will be doers of your word and see you bring forth your victory in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you most recently many messages on prophetic subjects and bringing prophetic revelation of things that are coming forth in these last days. Today we're going to talk about end time prophetic revelation in Job. And there is a lot that is in there. We begin in Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed is a word which means to turn aside. If you're here for the first time, you'll see in the lower window that I refer to things at time, from time to time. This is the Strong's number, keyed to Strong's concordance, and it gives them meanings and other information. This means to turn aside. So he was turning aside from evil, and he just didn't do it once in a while, because this is a mood of a participle active in the Hebrew. That's like a present tense in the Greek. It's like continuous, repeated, ongoing action. In other words, he continually turned aside from evil. He didn't give place to evil in his life. So he was a man who was considered perfect, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. As we look at this, you're going to see that Job is a revelation of the judgment that is coming upon the church in these last days, as well as the judgment that's coming to the world because the judgment will come to the church first and then it comes to the world. Also a revelation of the wrath of Satan that will come against Christians in these last days. And also we'll be talking about what's necessary for you to be protected and delivered during the great tribulation and days that are leading up to it, which we are in right now. And this is so important for you to understand this message. Now Job was one who lived at the way back, very early, and so it was well before Moses came on the scene in the law. And it's way that what we see is important to understand about the scriptures in knowing about the, how the things are going to happen in the end times, is we look first of it a scripture over in Ecclesiastes 1.9. Look what it says. The thing that hath been in the past is the, that which shall be meaning it's going to be again. That which is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. Otherwise, these things are going to happen again. They've already been foretold in the past. We see also in Isaiah chapter 46, we're even told that we are to remember the things of the past. Remember the former things of old because they're going to come around and happen again. For I am God, there's none else. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring, as you remember these things of the past, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. We know the end from the beginning. We know the things that have happened in the past are going to happen again. And we're going to see that as we look in the book of Job today. When we come here back to verse 1, first of all, we put the cursor over the name Job. I want you to notice what his name means. It means hated. Job is one who was hated. He is a type of the church, the remnant, the ones who are going on to perfection, that are walking in his ways, and they are hated. We are not of this world. The world people of this world, they hate the Christians. And you're going to see that hatred increase as we go down these days. God wants us to understand that the days that we are in, we're seeing the same thing begin to happen as we saw in the past prior to the flood when the people were violent. They were evil. You know, that it talks about how Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and yet God guarded him, as we saw what the word actually means. And, 2 Peter 2, 5, he'll guard us. At the same time, we see the violence. And this message today is not, a, not only appropriate for what's going to come, but also for what we're seeing right now. So we see people that are violent and are full of hatred and are anarchists and people that are just totally out of their minds. They don't even reason things correctly. It's going on today, right now. 
and we're going to see that that is going to happen. So his name was Job, hated, the hated one. Notice he says he was perfect. This is the word which refers to one as it's been translated as one who's undefiled, one who is upright. That's what it talks about Job. He was one who was complete, upright, one who was walking in the ways of the Lord without blemish, the root word of this means. He's upright here, which means he's walking right in uprightness according to the word, walking in the ways of the word of God, righteous. He's one that feared God. If you have the fear of God, you're going to turn away from evil. If you have the fear of God, you're going to then to walk in the ways of the Lord. You're going to delight greatly in his commandments, as the Bible says. And he turned away from all evil. God must, wants us to know that Job is a type of the remnant church that is being raised up in these last days. The few who are going to walk in his ways and go on unto perfection. The perfect, blameless, upright, walking in the fear of God church that is going to be that mighty end time church. Now, we must understand when it talks about the fact that he was perfect, this doesn't mean the fact that he never sinned. We know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. At the same time, one thing we need to point out, this being prior to the law, and this will be important for you to realize when we talk further in a little bit, but we need to take a look at Romans chapter 5 first. In Romans chapter 5, we see in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that was through Adam's sin, death by sin, that was the result of it, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's right. Everybody gets the effects of sin. At the same time, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there's no law. Even though sin is there and the effects of sin occur, from God's standpoint, until there was law, it's not imputed. That doesn't mean there's not the effects of sin. But it wasn't charged against them as far as God bringing a judgment upon them. And that is important for you to understand, which you'll, you'll see in a little bit. We must understand that Job was one who did not understand anything of the workings of Satan. He did not have revelation of him at all. We go on to verse 2, and it says, There was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men, although it actually says it's not men, it's the word bane in the Hebrew, which means son. He was one of the sons of God, see, who were walking in the sons of God line as opposed to the ones who rejected God's ways, which were the sons of men. Again, this word, translated son, 2,978 times, children would not, well, a good translation, it really means sons of, this, of, these, of what we see. It doesn't mean men. It shouldn't have been translated that, unfortunately. You kind of lose, this is talking about the sons of God who are following the way of the Lord. He was the greatest of all these sons of the East. He lived in the East at that time. So we come to verse 4, and it says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And his sons weren't like him. They weren't following the way of the Lord. And the sons here, from a type, are the ones who are not following the Lord, who are born-again Christians, who are Carnal, carnal and walking in compromise and just doing whatever they want to do. That's what these guys were doing. We see a lot of Christians today that are carnal, that are in compromise, that are not putting the Word of God first place, and seem to have a lot of the ways of the flesh and the ways of the world operating in their life, just as these guys were. We come to verse 5. He says, it was so when the day of their feasting was gone, were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that the son, my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. He was afraid that they would have sinned and cursed God. 
which means then they would be in judgment, they would be in trouble. Thus did God, thus, thus did Job continually. So he was continually trying to cover over their sins because he knew that they were not walking right. One thing we do have to address right off the bat, were his burnt offerings that he was offering up for their sins, was it effective? No. Why? Because of what the scripture says. He thought it would be, but it wasn't. We go over to Ezekiel chapter 18, and we see a important point made in verse 20, a scripture which has been highly misunderstood by most everybody in the body of Christ, unfortunately. It says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. People have thought that this verse means I can't have any inherited generational curses because they take it out of context, lift out one portion of the scripture, a classic, a classic example of taking a scripture out of context, and in fact, part of a scripture, because it says the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Well, people, I've heard people say this all over the world to me. Over in Africa, they brought these questions to me when I was over there, and they would say, well, this is what the scripture says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. That means there can't be any inherited generational curse coming down from the father. The son does not affected by the iniquity of the father. That's what they would say. Well, they missed the whole boat on this. First of all, the word bear means to lift or to lift up or to get rid of, to take something away, to lift up. The son shall not lift up the iniquity of the father. It's not talking about the effects of the iniquity of the Father. It's talking about lifting it up, getting rid of it. And notice what else it says. Neither shall the Father lift up the iniquity of the Son. Now, one of the things, even if it was meaning bear from the standpoint of you being affected by the iniquity of the Father, look at what it says. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. How do inherited generational curses go? They come of a father down to a son or a daughter, right? Go downward. Do they go upward? Do my sins affect my father from inherited generational? No. But look what it says. People think that. They read the first part, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, and made the false conclusion that that means that they can't have any inherited generational curses. But they skip the rest of it. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Well, they don't go upward. So that means it can't be talking about inherited generational curses. That's right, it's not. Because they never looked up the word and found out that the word means to lift or to lift up something. And what it's talking about is the son can't lift up the iniquity of the father. He can't get rid of the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father lift up the iniquity of the son. Uh, the father, who was Job, he can't get rid of the iniquity of those sons and daughters that were doing what they were doing. That's what it's talking about. And then he goes on and makes it clear, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Otherwise, if I'm walking in righteousness, then my righteousness will be upon me. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Meaning, if someone's walking in wickedness, it's going to be upon him, and no, nobody's going to be able to get it off of them just because I'm going to pray for them to get rid of their sin. That's what he thought he could do. He could offer a burnt offering, and that would get rid of the problem. No, it doesn't work that way whatsoever. And he was doing this continually. We see another scripture that's important to understand, and this is also important for the end times as well. Here in Ezekiel 14, verse 12, the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land, or the inhabitants of the earth it would refer to, because it's talking about them sinning, the land doesn't sin, it's the people of the land that sin. That's why this is talking about the inhabitants of the earth. When the inhabitants of the earth sin against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. This is talking about God's judgment. Though these three men, Noah, uh, he was at the time when everything was wicked before the flood, Daniel, well, he was the time when these guys had to, went to captivity because of all their wickedness. Remember, he was in Babylon. And Job, 
in the midst of here of when there was a lot of evil things that were going to happen, as you will see. They were all in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Otherwise, you can't deliver somebody else. You're not going to be able to deliver your children. You're not going to be able to deliver your wife or your husband or your father or mother or whoever. No. Everybody has to have the walk themselves. If, no, if I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it so it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beasts. That'd be a, another judgment coming because of sin. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall neither, deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered. But the land shall be desolate. This means that even Christians are not going to be delivered from judgments that are going to come from God because God's judgment will come against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness, regardless of whether they're born again or not. It's only whether they're walking righteous that is whether they're going to be delivered or not. We go on and he says, If I bring a sword upon that land and say, Sword, go through the land, so I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall neither deliver sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. If I send a pestilence in the land, these are the different judgments that come and they come. They came back in Exodus and they're going to come in the time of the judgment in the tribulation as well. Pour out my fury upon it and in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, yes, I live, saith the Lord God, they shall neither deliver, shall deliver neither the son nor daughter, but they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Then he goes on and says, For thus saith the Lord God, much more, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem. And you see these four judgments throughout the word of God happen continually, and they're going to happen again. Sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut it off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant. Aha! There is a people. There is a remnant. There is a few. There is the one who is the end time, perfected, glorious church. He's what it's a type of. That shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and you shall see their way and their doings, and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I brought upon it. Because the remnant are going to walk in the ways of righteousness, and they're going to come out victorious. They shall comfort you when you see your ways and your doings, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I've done in it, saith the Lord. This is a critical point as well. God does not do things without cause. He does things when there's a cause. Satan attacks regardless whether there's a cause or not. If he finds a cause, then he's got a right to come after you because the accuser of the brethren. But he'll attack you regardless. But God will never bring a judgment or do anything without a cause for that. He is just. He is righteous. He does things that are right. And that is important to understand. He only does things with a cause. Look at this scripture over in 1 Samuel, chapter 19, and verse 5. Here, it's speaking here about Jonathan speaking about to Saul, about not slaying David, we shall see. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. That's when he slew Goliath, you know. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to say David without a cause? Saul was wanting to kill him. He had no cause to kill him whatsoever. He would be in trouble if he would have gone through on that. And so he's presenting this to him. You can't go and do anything against him without a cause. And that's right. That would have been wrong. And of course, Saul ended up repenting of that. At the same time, you must understand the devil will again, as we say, come against you regardless of there's a cause or not. Look at what people are even doing today. They'll go and break up businesses and destroy things and want to kill you and destroy you, do anything you want. They don't care who you are. They don't have any cause. They're just going to do it. They're insane people that are totally overrun by devils that are in them. 
Psalms 35, verse 7, For without cause have they hid from me their net in a pit, which without cause they've digged for my soul. Well, this is talking about the devil, because he's wanting to come after your soul. Who comes after your soul? The enemy, Satan. And they've tried to dig, hid from me their net in a pit. Without cause, the devil will try to set you up for a fall to take you down. It doesn't matter whether you're walking right or not. So don't think, I wonder why all these things happen to me when you've been walking right. The devil will attack you regardless. At the same time, you open the door for him through sin, he's coming after you, and he's got a right to come after you because you gave place to him by giving place, of course, walking in the ways of sin. Verse 19, Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me, neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. Enemies will hate you without a cause. We're going to see that increase as we go down these days in the world. The devil, of course, hates you without a cause. You're going to see it happen in the tribulation period. We see it in Psalm 69 as well. We're driving this point home to you because it's important for you to understand and understanding what is going to happen. Psalm 69, verse 4, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. <laughs> all over the place. Talking about all the demons. The demons hate you. And they're, try, they're watching to try to get to you whenever possible. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. That's right. They're mighty, which means vast and numerous as well. Then I restored that which I took not away. So here the enemies are looking to get to you. Psalms 103. It talks about in the end times how the devil will come against the people of God. Psalms 109, verse 3. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. Again, people doing it today, you know they're run by the devil. And the devils will do this as well. In fact, it's even going to be rulers are going to come against you without a cause. Yeah, the rule of law should pretend, protect you, but you've got to understand you better look to God to protect you because the rulers are, don't want to follow the rule of law. Look what we got going on today. These people ignore the rule of law. Every one of these ones in any positions of a rulership, they ought to all be thrown out of office immediately because they don't obey the law. They, are, they have no right to be in any position of authority from God's standpoint. Princes, which means rulers and leaders. Rulers and leaders have persecuted me without a cause. So don't wonder why people are going to come against you. But my heart standeth in awe of thy word. So who's going to protect you? Don't look to anything outside of the Lord to protect you and deliver you. God is the one who is your protector. In fact, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 11 if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Doesn't matter whether they're innocent or not. You know, these crazy people, to shoot the policeman, doesn't matter. They're, they're nuts without a cause. He didn't do anything wrong. Just somebody, you know, gets ambushed in a car, ambushed on the street. These people are all driven by, driven by the devil, and this is what is going to be happening in the last days, more so than we've seen. This is just the beginning. Remember, we're going down these last days. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 52. My enemies chased me sore. <laughs> They'll even come after you like a bird without a cause. Well, the devils, of course, are doing this run by the enemy, Satan. Remember that God only does things when there is a cause, when he brings judgments. And he is a God who is just and will bring judgments. We see over in Proverbs 26, verse 2, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless, shall not come. Why does a curse come? Because of violation of the word, doesn't it? When you obey, you're blessed. When you disobey, curses come. That's a violation of the word. 
This is talking about things that are going to come according to spiritual law. Curses are going to come. Remember that what's, what's going to be, the, what is the judge that's in the earth? We see it over in John chapter 12, verse 48, when it speaks of, He that rejected me, rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, has one that judges him. The word that I've spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The word is what is the judge. It'll judge us, of course, in the last day as well. So this shows you that God only brings judgment because of a cause. The devil, he will come and try to come after you regardless of cause. Now, remember that judgment is coming to the church before it comes to the world. Most Christians do not understand this because they've not read the Word of God like they should. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Who's the house of God? That's the church. If at first, first in time, begin at us, what shall be the end of them that are obey or obeying not the gospel of God? Of course, they're finished for sure. Then it tells you the ones who are in the house of God that are going to come through victorious. In the next verse, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Who are the righteous? Now we need to stop here for a moment because we need to address this. We're going to address a lot of false teachings today as we're coming to bring this forth. The prevailing teaching in the body of Christ is everybody who's born again is perfectly righteous because they get a brand new spirit on the inside of them and so everything is fine. They may sin but they still have a spirit that's righteous and they think that that means they're righteous as one of the most abominable and lying teachings that's come forth in the body of Christ. Almost everybody teaches it. It is false. How do we know? Because when you get born again, you get a brand new spirit, and you have a spirit that's right. But how about when you sin? That's unrighteousness. Well, are you still righteous when you have unrighteousness in you? No. What determines whether you're really righteous? Let's look first of all at 1 John 2, 29. If you know that he is righteous, talking about the Lord, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Meaning these are the ones that are really following the Lord, doing righteousness. Well, that's more than just being born again. You could be born again and walking in sin. Present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. And then look at the scripture in 3.7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Why would God say, let no man deceive you? Because the subject he's addressing here, he knows that people have been deceived about this teaching and that they will be deceived about this teaching in the end times, which is exactly what's going on today about righteousness. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, that tells you something. It's not just being born again. It's doing the word of righteousness. Otherwise, you can be born again, and if you're walking in sin and you're full of unrighteousness, are you righteous? No. The righteous are the ones that are born again and doing righteousness. And this is a scripture that blows people away, but it's the truth. In this are the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. The ones who are following God, the ones who are not following God. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. That's quite a statement. You mean to tell me I can be born again and not doing righteousness and God says I'm not of God? That's right. That's not a mistake. This is the word poeo, which means to do or to make. And it's a present tense, meaning ongoing action. Or read the rest of it, too. Neither is he that loveth not his brother. If you don't love your brother, you've got hatred in your brother, you don't have any eternal life in you, you're not righteous whatsoever. And we're not right with him. So this is important that we understand this. Who are the righteous? The righteous are the ones who are born again and doing righteousness. We come to verse 18, talking about this judgment. 
if the righteous, the ones who are born again and doing righteousness continually, scarcely, this is a word that mollus, which means with difficulty and not easily. Why? Because you have to overcome sin, you have to overcome the flesh, you have to overcome the world, you have to overcome the devil. And you're well able to because God enables you to overcome everything. If the righteous, not with difficulty and not easily, it says be saved, what sounds like it's already been done. Mistake in the translation. You have to look everything up, not only whether the words are translated correctly, but also the tense voice and mood of the verbs. Watch the tense voice and the mood of this verb when I put it down here. It is a present tense. For you're here for the first time, we explain all this. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Literally, it would say, if the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, are continually being saved. And the reason we would say are continually being saved is because who's doing the work? God is, not us. And why would that be? Because the voice of the verb is very specific. Passive voice means somebody else is doing this work to the righteous. Who does the work in our life? God does. How? When we're doing the word. You can't produce your own salvation by just you doing whatever you want. It's God's the one who does it through the word in you. But the point of is the righteous are the ones who are doing righteousness with difficulty and not easily are being saved. That shows it's an ongoing process working in our life and we stay in that state if we're doing the word of righteousness. Oh, where shall the ungodly, the one who's not walking in God's ways, and the sinner, by the way, the sinner doesn't mean he's that by nature, referring to someone who's not born again. I'll tell you why. Because this is the word in the Greek, it's the word harmatia, here in this case, harmatolos, telos, and it's an adjective. It's not a noun. Sinner is a noun. This is an adjective, so it would describe the sinful ones, ones who are doing sinful things. So where shall the sinful ones and the ungodly ones appear? <laughs> They're in trouble. They're going to be judged when the judgment comes. Who comes through in the judgment? Only the righteous, who are hearing and doing the Word of God. And that is absolutely essential. So we've seen some important things that we had to cover first before we go far, for, further in Job. God only brings judgment with a cause. He never brings judgment without a cause. Satan will attack you regardless. And the ones who are the righteous are all the ones who are walking in righteousness and doing righteousness themselves. And you can't do, do anything to get your loved ones saved and protected. They have to walk it out for themselves. The ones who are the righteous are the perfected, glorious, end time remnant church. The ones who are not walking right are the carnal church that are going to see judgment come because they haven't been walking in the ways of the Lord. Now we go back to Job. Job 1, we see here how he's worried about the sins, sons, sons of sinning and cursed, that might have cursed God, so he was offering this, but it had no effect. Verse 6, now, there was a day when the sons of God, notice the sons of God, the sons of God are those who followed God's word. There was the line of Seth from the beginning. After Abel was killed, there was another seed given, and they were the sons of God line. The sons of men are the ones who did not follow the way of the Lord, and they rejected him. So it was a day when the sons of God, so these are the ones who are following God. What did they do? They came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Well, this is talking about people, isn't it? Sons of God. We see that the false teaching that has come forth in the body of Christ is thinking that this is talking about fallen angels. That's the teaching today. Because this is the word, Bain Elohim. Bain Elohim is the same phrase used for sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. In fact, let's go back over to that for a moment. Here's when men were multiplying the face of the earth, 
And it says, the sons of God, those are the ones who were following God, saw the daughters of men. He didn't say the daughters of God. Well, these are the daughters of men. They, sons and daughters of men had rejected God's ways and they were following the wrong way. It saw they were fair, they were beautiful. Ah, they got moved by looks. And they took them wives of all that they chose. They should have looked and found out whether they were daughters of God following God's ways, but they didn't. <laughs> they made a big mistake. So, man was doing wrong. That's when God said, my spirit, my spirit shall not strive with man, for that he also is flesh, or there are two Greek words here, or Hebrew words here, talking about his flesh. He's going astray and erring and committing sin and error in fle as, his, as flesh. Young's brings it out. You don't see it in the King James, but in their erring, their flesh, they were walking contrary. Because they weren't walk. This is the sons of men and the daughters of men line that were not following God. That's what he's talking about. And by the way, when he says, yet his days shall be 120 years, that's not talking about a lifespan. You might think it is, but it's not. Because Abraham and, uh, and Ishmael and those ones that were still around, they lived beyond 120 years. One lived 175, one was 140, one another was 130 years or so. So it's not talking about a lifespan. The 120 years, what's this all about? Because if he said, I can't, I have to strive with man because he's got 120 years. What 120 years? We're talking about jubilee years. Jubilee year was 50 years. 120 times 50 is 6,000 years. That is the time that man has on the earth to rule the earth because God gave man authority as a lease for 6,000 years to run the earth. That's the six days. Seven days of creation. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. We'll show you that scripture. Second Peter 3.8. Beloved, be not ignorant. We can't be ignorant of this. One day is with the Lord, it's a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Seven days of creation. Six days God worked, one day he rested. Six days is the, num six is the number of man. Six days is the 6,000 years that man had a lease given to him. It was a lease. In fact, we've talked about this in the past, but for those of you who haven't seen it, we're just kind of bringing this up to you again. Here in this parable, he's talking about this lease. He began to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let. The word let means to lease something. Let it out for hire or let it out for one's advantage. It is a lease. He let it out. And this is, and then he went to a far country. That's talking about God. He gave man a lease of authority to rule the earth for 6,000 years. Unfortunately, Adam disobeyed and rebelled against God. And what happened? The fall of man occurred. He submitted unto the devil. He spiritually was dead immediately that day. And what else happened? He gave the authority into the hands of Satan, who became the ruler of this age, the ruler of this world, the God of this world. Why hasn't God been able to do something about that for all these years? Because God is a just God. That lease is a legal document. In fact, everything he did in redemption was a legal act. We've talked about that in the past. And so therefore, he had to deal with that for the 6,000 years. And here man was in such a mess. You have to understand what God's saying back here. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. My spirit shall not all strive with man. I don't want to deal with this continually, essentially because he's been erring in his flesh, walking in sin. Yet, yet's not there, actually. It's not there in the Hebrew. It says his days shall be 120 years, or his days are 120 years. That's, a, that's times 50. At 6,000 years, this guy's in control of the earth, and it's been given in the hands of Satan. Now, this was not even close to the, this was in the beginning, remember, back there before the flood. And, of course, that's why he says, I'm going to destroy the whole group. 
He's had it with him. He comes there, saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They repented the Lord. He'd made man on the earth and grieved him in his heart. And so what did he say? He says, I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, repented me that I've made them. But somebody found grace in his eyes. It was Noah. Noah, why? Because he was just. He was perfect in his generations. Same with what we saw about Job. And he walked with God. Same with Job. See, God saw that. Now, we've got to go back here for a moment. We saw these sons of God that were God's line, walking after the word. We have the daughters of men who are not following the way of the Lord. Who should sons of God be marrying? Daughters of God, not daughters of men. Look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown. People have come up with this, and it is totally false teaching, that the sons of God is referring to fallen angels. It is widely taught in the body of Christ today. It is taught by many ministers. It is taught by those in the messianic group, taught by those who are in prophetic circles, taught by all kinds of people. They translated the Septuagint here as angels in the Septuagint, which is the Greek, transla Greek translation of the Old Testament done in 2nd century B.C. What a mistake. It's also been translated, the NIV translates it as angels. If you have an NIV, you look at an NIV, it'll translate as that. It doesn't mean that. It's Bain Elohim. God says what he means and means what he says. He didn't say sons of God and mean angels. Yet people have said, well, that's what happened. The sons of God, the fallen angels, came in the daughters of men, and we have all these giants. That's the teaching. How many people have heard that teaching? I'm sure you have. It's a lie. It's totally from the devil and deceived the multitudes. How can I say that? Well, number one, it doesn't say angels. It says sons of God. Secondly, let's read the beginning of the verse. There were giants in the earth in those days. Fact. They were already here. And also after that, after that means following after, behind, afterwards of time. Giants are here. After that, not before that producing giants, but after that, when the sons of God, disobeying God, came into the daughters of men, what a mistake. They bear children to them. The same became mighty what? Gabor, mighty men that were of old men. This is the word Enosh, which means mortal man. They're men of renown. Well, that's not some hybrid of angels and women mating together. That's insane. And yet almost everybody out there teaches this stuff. It's astounding. And I'll tell you, I call every minister and everybody's believed this to repentance because this is an abomination to teach these kind of things. The giants were already here. So the sons of God and the, going to the daughters of men didn't produce the giants. They already were here, weren't they? What's the word giants mean, by the way? It comes from 5307, if you look down here in the origin part, when I double-click this and put it on the curve here, this is what the word means. It means fall, the fallen ones. That's why Young's translates it this way. He did a good job on it. It really means the fallen ones. Well, they assume, well, that must mean the fallen angels. No, it's talking about the fallen ones who are the sons of men and the daughters of men that fell away from the way of God and did not follow him anymore. That's who it's talking about. Not angels. It's a total lie. Furthermore, see this TWO2T? 
I'm going to show you this. This is the Theological Workbook of the Old Testament, an outstanding source of information for, and it, notice this number, 1393A. I'm going to show you this. This is a tremendous program that has all this, 1393A. Here's 1393A, if you look, and you'll see when it comes down here near the bottom where they talk about it, starting at this point, he says, actually, the translation giants is supported mainly by the LXX. That is the Septuagint, that's the, what means the Septuagint version, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And may be quite misleading. The word may be of unknown origin and mean heroes or fierce warriors. That's what they think. The RSV and NIV transliter transliteration Nephilim is safer and may be correct in referring to the noun as a race or a nation. It's not referring to angels. There's no reason in the world for them to have translated it angels. And yet it's deceived the multitudes to think that we're talking about fallen angels. I always say, well, if that was the fallen angels mating with the daughters of men, can angels produce they can't reproduce. They don't reproduce. They're all always male. Furthermore, let's say they did show me an example of one of these hybrids today. <laughs> they don't really exist, do they? No. It's all lies from the devil. Total false teachings. Never that whatsoever. Furthermore, we're taking the time to really show you this, to help you to understand this. Is the word angel translated somewhere? We can see what the word angel is. Sure. This is the first use of the word angel in the Old Testament, where actually the word angel is, and it's the word malach. Malach, translated angel the, the majority of times, as you see there, 111 of the times. Angel, sometimes it can mean messenger, depending upon the context. The angel. So it's malach. Well, if he meant for that, he would have said, Something about Malak, wouldn't he? But he didn't say Malak ever. Another thing we had to look at, go, we're going to go back to Job for a moment. If this is talking about here in verse 6, about the sons of God meaning angel, well, I guess maybe they just didn't have the word angel back then. Is the word angel in Job? Well, let's see. If we look through Job and you do a little word study through it, Job 4.18, Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels. Well, they, the God, writer of Job did know that there was a word for angel. He wouldn't have said, Bang Elohim, sons of God, if he made angels. Because here's the word, look at it, Malach, below. So he knew about angels. Let's also look at some other verses to really drive this point home. Because I'll tell you, all these ministers, all these ones that teach this, they need to repent and get it right because they're in trouble. Genesis 16, verse 11, the angel of the Lord, Malach, notice it below, said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son. Here's the word son. Look at it. When I put the cursor over it, look at it below. It's Ben, Bain, the word for son. So we got a verse where they're both used. There's no confusion there, is there? The angel didn't mean son, and the son didn't mean angel. It meant exactly what it said, didn't it? We'll look at some more and drive this point home. Genesis 24, 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, spake to me, swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel, Malach, before thee. And thou shalt take a wife unto my son, Bain. Here's another one in verse 10. The servant took the ten camels, blah, blah, blah. We come down here. Um, in the, no, it's four, I'm sorry, not 1040. I didn't read it right. 2440. The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel, Malach, notice it below, and prosper thy way, and they shall take a wife for my son, Bain, as you see it. Well, maybe that was just in Genesis. No. People come up with all kinds of stuff, won't they? Judges chapter 2, verse 4, try to explain away things. When the angel, Malach, 
all the children, it's the word should be sons of Israel, it's Bain. Look at it below. Chapter 6. We're taking this time to drive this point home. Then came an angel, Malach. And here he's speaking to his son, Gideon, Bain. Here's another one. Judges 13, verse 3. The angel, Malach, it's always Malach. And he talks about conceiving and bearing a son, Bain. Here's one other one. First Chronicles 21, verse 20. Angel, Malach, and his four sons, Bain. Son is always a son. Angel is always an angel. This isn't just now. This is for centuries. People have believed that the sons of God were fallen angels, and it's a big lie, and deceived the people away from the actual truth. False teaching. So, why is that important? Because in Job 1.6, they are saying that this is the angels coming to present them as spells before the Lord, fallen angels, and Satan coming among them. Would the angels come to present themselves before the Lord that have already fallen? No. They got kicked out of heaven already because this is talking about, you know, Satan, the fallen, fallen one. This is talking about the fallen angels. They already got kicked out. They were thrown out, remember? Cast down to hell. Well, so that doesn't line up. So this deceives people from understanding what was going on here. Now, another thing we need to address there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them, all right? What is really happening here? The sons of God, who are the ones following God, which is a type of the church, which is you and me, and what are we all doing? We're all presenting ourselves before God today because God is coming to the church to find out who's going to follow him and who's not going to follow him. Otherwise... He's going to take a good look at every one of us and see whether or not we're following the Lord or not. Present themselves to see whether or not they're going to pass the test or they're going to be judged, whether they're going to be in trouble or not. When you see this word present, the other thing they have said, the people have said is, well, this is talking about in heaven, I guess, at heaven because that's where the angels were and Satan comes among them and all that. No, this is talking about on earth. To present themselves. This is the word yatsab. Yatsab means to present yourself or to station yourself or to set oneself or present yourself in some way. So why would you be presenting yourself? Because you want to see whether he's going to prove you or not or whether you're going to be judged, right? Look at these scriptures. We're going to take the time to look at some of these to show you. This is talking about men presenting themselves before God. Did they do that? They sure did. Exodus 19, verse 17. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood, yatsab, same word, at the nether part of the mount. And God's going to speak to them. See, they come to meet God, and he's going to speak to them. They're presenting themselves to him, actually. And the reason we would say this is because this is what's called a hithpale stem. The hithpale stem, the stems have different meanings. That's where it's used here, and it's like a reflexive or like a middle voice in the Greek, meaning it's the, talking about the person doing it for himself. That's why it's translated station oneself or present oneself or, or in some meaning you're doing something for yourself. That's what it means. So they stood them. That's why Young's does a good job here. That's why we always have Young's up here. They station themselves. Every one of us get to station ourselves, present ourselves before God to see what, what he is going to say to all of us. And what happened, of course? Then God comes down. He descended upon it, come down to Mount Sinai, and he's going to speak to them at that point. Let's go over to Numbers, chapter 11. Verse 16, 
The Lord said to Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of elders, elders of Israel, which, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle, that they may stand Yatsab. Same word there with thee. Well, this is on earth. This isn't in heaven. Every case where you see Yatsab, it's always on earth. It's not talking about something going on with angels in heaven. It's ridiculous. And so what's going to happen? There, that they may stand there because God's going to come and he's going to talk to them. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua, present Yatsab yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give them a charge. Otherwise, these guys would present themselves before God so God would tell them what to do. That was a common thing that happened in the Old Testament. We see in Joshua, chapter 24, verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes, called for elders. They came up there and they presented themselves, Yatsab, before God. So that then God could speak to them, tell them what, was, what they were to know. Judges, chapter 20, verse 2. Chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. They did this on a regular basis. And I'm taking the time to do this, to drive this home, so you are not ever confused or, or thinking that these guys, maybe they're right. They're all wrong on their teachings about this being fallen angels. 1 Samuel 10, 19. You have this day rejected your God himself, saved you out of all your adversities, your tribulations, and you said nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes. Yatsab. Every case. And this one is an interesting one, and we'll see in chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 12, 7. Now therefore stand still, this is Yatsab, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. This is when they wanted, remember that they rebelled against God and they wanted a king uh, over them. In fact, if we back up here, look at verse 13. Now behold the king you've chosen, whom you've desired. Well, God gave them the king. They wanted a king, but it wasn't his will. They were supposed to have the prophets continue to rule over them. So he set a king over them, which was wrong. And so we come down to verse 16. He says, Now therefore stand, Yatsab, and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is God pleased that they did this? Did this? No. And now he's saying, You present yourself, and this is what God's going to do. And this is also relative to us today. I'll tell you why. He says, is not the wheat harvest today? There were two harvests, the barley harvest, and there was also a wheat harvest, and there were other harvests of their crops. The barley harvest was the Jews, because that was the first harvest that happened in the beginning of the year, at the first Hebrew month. The wheat harvest was always in the third month, which is the time of Pentecost, which speaks of the church. And so he's talking about the harvest of the wheat this is prophetic of the church age. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain. Thunder and rain is always speaks of judgment. That you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. Otherwise, judgment's going to come upon you. So Samuel called on the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord. And Samuel the judgment was sent forth. This is all a type of the judgment that is going to come on those who don't pass the test that are, as it said, they're in wickedness. Those who are in wickedness are going to have the judge, judgment. But is the type of the end time church then being presented before the Lord? Of course, we're to be blameless, undefiled, upright, fearing God, gone unto perfection. That's the one the remnant church are that God is raising up in this day. Yet the carnal compromised church and people that did wickedness of any type are going to be judged. Now if you think, well, I thought that the wrath of God was not going to happen to the church. I'm talking the ones that are walking wrong, it is going to happen to them. Look what it says. 
Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All. That doesn't mean some. It means all. Ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Can you be born again and be ungodly, doing ungodly things? Yeah. Can you be walking in sin and be in an unrighteousness? Yeah. When it says who hold, that's a, not a good translation. It really means to our holding back, is what this word actually means, holding back the truth in unrighteousness. Otherwise, they're not walking in truth. They're walking in unrighteousness and sin. What's going to happen to those that are walking in sin? They're going to be judged. Now, another scripture we ought to look at for a moment. It's over in Zechariah chapter 3. It says, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. The Lord said to Satan, by the way, where is this happening? This is beyond earth, where the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. I mean, he had sin. Stood before the angel. Well, he's going to be judged if something doesn't happen, right? He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Get all that filthiness away from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Why would the iniquity pass? Because you got rid of the filthiness. If you get rid of all the filthiness and the uncleanness, all the sin and all these evil things out of your life, the iniquity passes, see. And he says, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment, meaning you're going to get new clothes. Don't we put off the old man and put on the new man? Get rid of all the all, uh, things that are not of God? Get rid of all the filthy garments and get the garments of God on? Yes, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is speaking up. Now, let's go back to Job now. So here, this is not talking about the fallen angels. It's a lie. It's talking about the, God, the sons of God who are the people who are following God are coming to present themselves before God. See whether they're approved or not. A type of the church being presented to see who's going to pass the test, the righteous, and who's going to be judged. Because the judgment comes to the church before it comes to the world, remember. And Satan comes among them. And verse 7, The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered, and the Lord said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. What's Satan always looking to do? To devour and bring destruction in some way, right? Now, this is another part where it's really important for you to get this. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil? People have thought that this means, what is God doing? Dangling Job before Satan, say, hey, look at this guy, he's a perfect guy. You know, if you're going to try to kill somebody or wipe him out or destroy him, hey, look, at this is a pretty good guy. He'd be a good guy to go after. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. When you put the cursor over the word considered, there were two Hebrew words here. The first one is this word sum, which means to set. And there's another word behind it, down here, which is the word lab. Lab means heart. Translated heart 508 times out of the 592 uses correctly. This is why in the Hebrew it says, Hast thou set thy heart against my servant Job? Not considered my servant Job. It's a terrible translation and totally false and totally deceives you away from the truth. He's not saying, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's a pretty good guy. No. He's saying, have you set your heart against my servant Job? Otherwise, he's coming after Satan. Here, have you set your heart against him? Because what does Satan come to do? To destroy, doesn't he? He did set his heart against him. And of course, what does Satan come to do? Remember, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
Satan answered the Lord and says, Does God, Job fear God for not, for no reason, without cause, or any reason? Verse 10, Satan says, Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Well, him saying that shows the fact that we can have a hedge built to protect us. That's right, if you do the right things. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance increased in the land. That's right, that's what God will do. And he was blessed greatly. We come over here to verse 11. Now he says, put forth thine hand and touch all that he hath and he'll curse thee to thy face. He's trying to get God to bring judgment against him. Put forth thy hand. The word touch actually means to strike, not touch. It means to strike, strike against. That's why Young's corrects it. Strike against all he has. Just go wipe out all the things you've given to him and he'll end up cursing you to your face. Remember, he set his heart against him. God knew what Satan was up to that he was wanting to plan on destroying him. And Satan's trying to get him to, cur to curse, essentially, all of his possessions. Come against him. Strike all that he has. And he'll turn around and just curse you to your face. <laughs> Is God going to obey Satan? No. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Why is that? Because the hedge was already down. And God knew it, and Satan knew it. Yeah, they both knew it. And why could he get to him for his power? Because the hedge was down. Why was the hedge down? Job 3.25 The thing which I greatly feared is come unto me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Fear took down the hedge. The hedge was down. God knew it. Satan knew it. People have misunderstood this whole thing and thought that, well, I guess the Lord decided he's going to give permission to Satan to go ahead and go after him. No. God would never do anything as such whatsoever. He's just stating him the facts the way they already were. He already was in his power. But notice what he restricts. He says, only put himself, put upon himself not, put, put, but upon himself put not forth thine hand. Why was that? Because he never cursed God. He couldn't touch his life, but he could come after all, all the things that he had. Why? Because the hedge was down. You know, three people could be involved in taking the hedge down. God could have taken the hedge down, Satan could have taken the hedge down, or Job could have taken the hedge down. Would God take the hedge down? No. Would, can Satan take the hedge down himself? No. The only person that takes the hedge down is man. And Job did it by his fear. So he says, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And what was he heard? He had to set his heart against them all. So what's he going to do? Well, he couldn't get God to destroy him. All he had. Yeah, that didn't work, so Satan's going to go and try to destroy all he has. And what's he do? He starts going after him. Goes after his sons and daughters. What happens? The oxen were plowing, the asses coming, the Sabians fell upon him, slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Ah, the, the, they went after these guys that were walking in sin and carnality, and the, judge, and the enemy was able to bring, again, destruction on them. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God's fallen from heaven. Now that was a truly stated, but it's not the truth. It wasn't the fall of God. It was the devil, remember. And it burned up the sheep, the servants consumed them, and I only am I am escaped only to alone to tell. Notice each time it says, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. One guy gets out of it, the rest of them get destroyed. What's the one guy speak of? The remnant, the few who are walking right. Oh, they're not going to get hit by the enemy. But the ones that aren't right are going to get hit by the enemy. The attacks will come because Satan is going to go to try to bring destruction. While he's yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, fell upon the camels, carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped to tell thee. Every time it says, I only am escaped. 
That's a type of the remnant, glorious, perfected, walking in righteousness church that will escape any attacks of the enemy while the people that are walking in sin will get taken down. And that's what's going to happen. While he's yet speaking, came another and said, The sons and daughters are eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. A great wind from the wilderness came, smote the four corners of the house, and fell upon the young men, and they're dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Why does it keep saying that? Four times it talks about that, because it's stressing only the ones who are right are going to escape the attacks of the enemy. Remember, in the book of Revelation, the devil goes after all those to try to destroy them all. Well, there's not everybody gets destroyed. They just try to kill them all. Who comes through victorious? The remnant, perfected, holy, glorious, without spot, without wrinkle, without holy, unrebukable, unreprovable church that's come forth. We're the ones that escape. And God, of course, they got delivered from this situation. Job arose, ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground and, wor and worshipped. And he says, Naked came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. People have thought, well, I guess that's the truth. It's truly stated, but it's not the truth. Remember, did Job know about Satan? Did he have revelation about him? No. He thought it was God giving and the God taking away. It wasn't God taking away. It was the devil attacking, who having set his heart against him, was going after him. And the reason was, which he didn't understand, the hedge was down because of his fear. That's truly stated, but not the truth. So people say, well, see, God, God can do anything he wants. And this gives rise to the, another lying doctrine taught, the sovereignty of God doctrine which says God can do anything he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. Not so. God only does what's in line with his word. He performs his word. He'll bring judgment if there's a cause, remember, but he won't bring judgment if there's not a cause. And he doesn't take things away just arbitrarily because he wants to. This is not the truth. He said this, and look what's said after that. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Why? Because he did not know about Satan. He didn't have knowledge. If he had known, then it would have been sin. But he didn't know. He didn't understand. He thought it was the Lord doing all these things. They did not have, he did not have revelation of these things whatsoever. There's a day when the sons of God, again, same ones, Ben Elohim, came to present Yatsab themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered and said, Going to and fro the earth, walking up and down, same situation. Have you set your heart again, same thing, against my servant Job, none like him in the earth, perfect, upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and he holds, still he holds fast his integrity. Though thou movest me, the word move is means to incite or to instigate or to entice me, which is God, against him to destroy him without cause. The devil was trying to get God to destroy Job without cause. Of course, is God going to do that? No. He'll never bring judgment without cause. He only does it because of a cause. So, uh, Satan answered the Lord, says, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, you know. And he says, put forth thine hand again, and touch or strike again, same thing. Strike, before he said, strike all he had, which is all, all the different things, his sons and his daughters, and they were losing all their possessions and so forth, sheep and, you know, all the ones who were getting destroyed. Now he's talking about, touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse thee to thy face, he's saying. Well, you know, just ca cause some physical problems to come upon him, on his bones and his, in his flesh, and he'll curse you, and he'll give up on you. Now the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in thy hand, save his life. Why? Because fear. He was afraid of all these things that were going to come. 
And so what happened? It wasn't God. This is clear as a bell. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord, and what did he do? He smote Job with the sore boils from the sole of his foot into his crown. Smote him. Satan was smiting him with all these things. And of course, his wife says, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. He wants him to curse God and die. <laughs> he's not going to do that. Because he th he's right with God, remember, but he thinks God's responsible for all these things, which he's not. He just didn't know. He said to her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Because he thinks evil's coming from God. He doesn't know any better yet. In all this did not Job sin with his lips. You've got to understand, why is that so? Even though we, today, it would be sin. But he didn't know it. That's why it wasn't sin before his lips. And then it begins to talk about these friends. So we've introduced this today, and what you see is this. Job is a type of the remnant church, the glorious church that's going to be walking right with the Lord, that is going to be presented before him as the judgment is going to come to the church first, and he, because he is righteous, walking in the ways of the Lord, is going to be saved. He is going to be delivered. At the same time, the ones who are not walking right, which would be his sons and daughters, when the judgments come, as well as, which would be for cause, as well as the attacks from Satan, which are without cause, he'll just attack anyway, they aren't going to be able to stand. Only the ones who are right with God are going to be able to escape. Remember, I only escaped. Only the ones that are right are going to be able to escape. The rest of them are going to be destroyed. They'll get martyred out. They'll have all kinds of destruction that will come. This is what is going to happen. At the same time, we've also talked about the lie of the fallen angels teaching. It's the sons of God who are presenting himself. And so that's deceived people from understanding what's being said. They have no idea it's talking about the end time church being presented before the Lord when the judgment is coming. And they thought that that's what produced the giants when the giants were already here before the sons of God went into the daughters of men. And it's deceived people to believe this line teaching about fallen angels mating with women, which is ridiculous. It's an abomination, which we proved. It's all a lie. Because the giants, which really means the fallen ones, the fierce warriors, were already here. It's all the result of sin. So, we also see the fact that God wasn't given permission. No, it was already, the hedge was already down because it was fear for Satan to go and attack him. So we see the fact that God wasn't the one who was saying, hey, have you considered Job dangling him out there before him? No. Have you set your heart against my servant Job? That's what he was saying, because he was coming out, I come after him. God will protect those who are walking right. The ones who aren't walking right, whether they're not born again or are born again, they're going to get hit, because the wrath of God, his judgment will come when it's going to be poured out during that three and a half years. The judgment's going to pour, and it's going to hit everything that's ungodly and unrighteous. Doesn't matter whether you're born again or you're not, you're going to get hit. Only the ones who are righteous are going to be saved and are going to be protected and are going to escape. We see that so clearly shown here in what we begin to talk about in Job. We've got a lot to talk about. We'll be talking about things that are here that show more about the ones who aren't going to get victory and why. But we'll also see the remnant and what they're going to do in order to get victory and come forth. One scripture we want to look at before we quit. Job 19, 25. People have not understood this verse. I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's right. That's not talking about just the fact that he's just alive. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. 
And this word, when it talks here about standing, this really is a word meaning to arise. This is the word means arise or arise or stand up. And in the sense of what he comes to in the latter day is to bring judgment, it really refers to arise in a hostile sense, uh, arise as a hostile sense in the latter day, because what is Jesus coming to do? To bring judgment upon the earth as he's taking back the authority of the earth after the 6,000 years are over, and he's going to establish the millennial reign, but first he's going to bring the judgments upon the nations the church having been judged first to find out who's going to be right and not remembers the apostasy of the ones that aren't right to fall away these are the things that are going to happen and this is talking about at the end not what he did in the beginning my redeemer liveth and he shall stand with his hostile arising with his hostile sense at the latter day to bring forth the judgment and take back the authority and begin to rule and reign in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ we're going down some very exciting days. At the same time, these are perilous times. At the same time, we got to know what the Word of God says and be right with Him and know what God will do. At the same time, know what's going to happen to all these others. That's why we need to be preaching the gospel to them and praying for people to come to repentance and get right because it's not very far away. And for you who haven't heard, you may have heard for the first time, you haven't known this, we'll just say this. 6,000 years began at the beginning. Four days, a day is a thousand years, four days we're told Jesus Christ came and accomplished the redemption. That's 4,000 years. That 4,000 years elapsed and was done when Jesus accomplished the redemption. That was in 30 A.D. The next two days is the church age, 2,000 years. It began in 30 A.D. 2,000 plus 30 makes 20, 30 A.D. We're at 2020 A.D. We are 10 years away from the church age. Then the tribulation, which you need to read the book on Daniel's 70 weeks book, or listen to the messages on that, is only three and a half years, not seven years. It's a lying teaching from the devil. Another one that's deceived. There's so many false teachings that have deceived the multitudes. It's astounding. How can you say there's not a seven-year tribulation? Because there was 69 of those 70 weeks of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy until Messiah came to rule and start his, and he did start his, his ministry. Talking about Messiah the Prince. How long did he minister to the Jews? Because that was God's dealing with the Jews. 69 weeks of dealing with them. He ministered to them for three and a half years. That's a half a week because a week is seven years. So 69 and a half weeks have elapsed when he died on the cross. There's a half week left of God's dealing with the Jews. That half week is the last three and a half years, which parallels the tribulation, and all Israel is going to get saved. If you didn't hear the messages on John chapter, John prophetic that we just did, you need to hear them, especially out of John chapter 11, where the Jews are all going to get saved. It's in there. Tremendous things are going to happen. And some people thought, well, how do you know this is really about 6,000 years and all this stuff? Some people still don't want to believe it. The seventh day, which is the time of the rule of Jesus Christ on earth, the millennial reign, how long is it? It's 1,000 years. It says it several times in Revelation. If the seventh day, which is the rule of Jesus, 1,000 years, what were the six days? 6,000 years. Don't wonder about the days that we're in and say, well, maybe these are going to go away. They're not going to go away. The New World Order is going to rise, unfortunately, and the Antichrist will come on the scene. The only the ones who are righteous, who are walking in his ways, will come through victorious. And that is what you and I are to do, to walk in His ways, work out our own salvation, do everything that God says, and be a vessel to preach the gospel to others and call them to repentance, that they would get right with the Lord. You think that all this stuff's going to go away? It's not going to go away. The intensity will occur. The New World Order will rise before the end of this decade, ready for the Antichrist to take over. These things are going to happen. That's why we got to know the time that we live in. 
and be sure we're following the way of the Lord 100%. Make him Lord of all. Put him first place in your life. And understand, Job is a type of this judgment that's coming for the church. It'll happen for the world. And it shows us, as you'll see, in the next two times we get together, we'll be talking about the ones, all the things that they do that are wrong, that bring judgment upon them, and they will not walk victorious. And we'll talk about the ones who do come through victorious and what's necessary. And Job reveals it all. So we'll be talking about it. Praise God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation in the book of Job concerning the end times and the judgments that are coming upon the earth as that comes to the church first and then it comes to the world and I understand that only the righteous will escape and will be victorious and will be protected. I thank you that I will walk in your ways and I will make sure that I'm upright before you with a fear of God, gone on to perfection, and I will see your protection come forth in my life. Thank you for the revelation of the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I trust this has helped you as we've covered a lot of, especially false teachings, the sovereignty of God, false teaching, the fallen angels, false teaching, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's ridiculous. These people need to repent and get right instead of leading people astray. Father, we thank you for all that you've brought forth. Thank you for the truth. Thank you as you're bringing revelation of what's going to be happening. So we're prepared and we will walk in your ways and we're going to warn others. Thank you, Father, for much for as we're walking in your ways, being doers of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we're going to continue on this.